Thank you, Regina, and thank you all for coming here and join each other in our interests for this subject and to meet each other. And to me, it's wonderful to see you all here meeting old friends, meeting new friends. This is an occasion. Well, the title of my paper could have been more precise. In fact, I would like to say something about the private trade of the Dutch in porcelain in the 17th century. And that's a rather difficult aspect because there is not much information. The Dutch East India Company is wonderful in its archives and in its papers, but they don't say much about private trade. Uh, well, due to many Dutch publications, including those of myself, most people have the impression that the Dutch East India Company, or the VOC, had a monopoly of the porcelain trade, and that most, if not all, Chinese and Japanese ceramics were exclusively shipped on VOC ships to the Netherlands to be sold there at auction. Well, Miki Sakuraba has already prepared you for the fact that this view needs some corrections. Even before the Dutch East India Company was founded in 1602, porcelain circulated already in the Netherlands, as is demonstrated by archaeological excavations in Dutch city centers. It may have been rare and expensive, but it was well known among the higher and even the middle classes. Therefore, when the company ships started to sail to Asia, sailors and officers were prepared to find this exotic com commodity on the Asian markets. And of course, it was not only company's business that made them keen to buy porcelain. It was their private interests as well. And I think that these two pencil drawings from the lock of a VOC ship, the Gelderland, dating to 1604, shows the private interest of the unknown Brotman for crack porcelain uh, that he considered a profitable commodity, perhaps. Uh, he drew this as a an interesting object. Uh, he also made drawings of birds and fishes, uh, including the famous dodo of Mauritius. But this was something that was special as well. And I think he had a keen interest to make these drawings to show to his countrymen uh, or to show to middlemen who could sell him these pieces. He had a good observation. See how the rims are depicted. And what I find very interesting is how the dish is placed on top of a bowl. Um, that was the way they did it, apparently, in the early 17th century. We wouldn't think of exhibiting crack porcelain that way in a museum gallery. Chinese porcelain then soon became a regular item for the Dutch East India Company, but I have no doubt that private trade closely followed in its wake. Unfortunately, we don't have documents on such private dealings, and therefore we mistakenly assume that the official VOC papers present the whole story. But I don't think, for instance, that this transitional beaker, the first example I know of Chine de Commande in shape and decoration made after a Dutch model was ordered by the company. On the contrary, this must have been really a private order and a private experiment. And as you can see, the silver beaker, the silver model, has the same decoration engraved um, as you see on the porcelain imitation. The silver beaker is often um, regarded as a beaker for use in the churches. I don't think that is the use for the porcelain 
beaker. It may have had a cover, but we are not sure of that. It's a recent acquisition of the Groningen Museum, and I can tell you that it was in the possession of one of my students, who became aware of its value and interest after she had had my lessons in the university in Leiden. So that was a good thing to combine. Well, um, after this private interest, um, I think that it was probably stimulating the slightly later orders of the company for transitional porcelain that featured Dutch shapes, as you can see on this slide, the very common type, the ewers with the long spout, and, and the mustard pot that is in the Dresden Swinger collection. Well, we get glimpses of private trade when we read the proclamations of the company that try to forbid or at least minimize the shipments of the private cargoes. In 1618, for instance, private commodities to a value of 100 guilders were permitted, although the VOC kept the right to confiscate such private trade. And of course, they did not pay more than the same 100 guilders as compensation. And that might have been profitable because everyone tried to get more in their ship's cargo uh, and when it was confiscated you had a real loss. The ledgers of the company frequently tell us of smuggled and sized porcelain but rarely give us details on shape and decoration. As you know, in 1644, the Ming Dynasty came to an end, and during the succeeding civil wars, the transport of porcelain from Jintijen to the coast became blocked. Therefore, the VOC could not buy sufficient amounts of porcelain, resulting in a shortage um, in the Netherlands. At this stage, it was the private trade, again, the private trade that offered new possibilities, new venues. In the early 1650s, the company directors in Amsterdam noticed the profitable imports of Japanese porcelains by private individuals. And they asked Batavia, the headquarter of the Dutch East India Company, you see here, um, to supply some samples of this Japanese porcelain, of this porcelain they told us, um, because maybe that was a good thing to try to get onto the market in the Netherlands um, as an alternative for Chinese porcelain. They did not say porcelains in general. They uh, no, they did not say Japanese porcelains, but porcelains in general. And the Dutch governor in Batavia, he was well aware that these were the porcelains that came from Arita as the private trade. Samples were sent, orders for Japanese porcelain followed, and in a very short time, the Japanese porcelain replaced Chinese on the Dutch home market. It became very fashionable not in the least because the colorful enameled designs were so exciting um, and uh, after half a century of blue and white crack porcelain and transitional porcelain this really was something new but without this private initial private trade, the introduction of Japanese porcelain in Europe might have been different. And in that case, Augustus the Strong may not have had the opportunity to collect such a large and wonderful selection of Arita wares. As you see here in the storage of the Zwinger Museum. The second an even more important impact of the private portion trade on the European scene took place in the 1690s and it was really very influential. Again, the political and economical situation was a main factor for what happened in China. 
because the civil wars had ended in the early 1680s when the Qing Emperor Kangxi had suppressed all resistance. Arts and crafts in the southern coastal areas that had been depopulated by force during the wars flourished again. Overseas trade followed very quickly and producers of porcelain and zintigen who had rebuilt their demolished kilns finally had opportunities for exporting their wares again. They must have been aware of the success of Japanese colored porcelain in Europe because they developed new overglazed enamel types. For instance, Famille Vert, which became one of the most chic and attractive types of export for the European customers. Porcelain, Chinese porcelain merchants did not wait for their customers to come to China. They shipped porcelain to markets all over Southeast Asia, including Dutch Batavia. This was a very welcome situation for the Dutch East India Company because they did not have to send ships out to China to buy porcelain. They could wait what the Chinese youths were bringing to them. There was much more choice now in shapes and in patterns, and the prices were much lower than in Japan and than they were used to in the early 17th century. In 1683 already, the company decided to stop buying Japanese porcelain, for the Dutch market at least, as Mickey has explained to us, and the Dutch East India Company concentrated on Chinese porcelain for export to Holland only. We see two developments now. First, the private trade in Japanese porcelain continued because the profits in the Netherlands were so good. And secondly, more important, the quickly increasing supply of Chinese porcelain on the free markets in Batavia generated a keen interest of private dealers and private individuals to bought choice items in small quantities. Transport of these items to the Netherlands was easy. They shipped their porcelains on freight on the homebound company ships. And in Holland, new drinking and dining fashions, as well as the increasing use of Asian porcelain for interior decoration, demanded huge quantities of imports, while at the same time, customers became very selective and they were asking for the latest fashions in shapes and in decorations. The company itself could not cope with this fragmenting market. It needed bulk shipments and a limited assortment, easy to buy and easy to handle. And in contrast, the private dealers were able to react very quickly to the ever-changing and specific demands in the Netherlands. For instance, it was due to them that many new varieties of Chine de Commande designs were introduced in the late 17th century, probably starting with dinner sets decorated with the coat of arms of Dutch upper classes living and working in Batavia. Private merchants obviously made very good profits and therefore attracted strong private competition. Of course, the competition the VOC could not match. After 10 years, the company gave up all her efforts to make her own trade in porcelain successful. In 1694, the directors in Amsterdam wrote to the governor general in Batavia, and I quote, the huge amounts brought by individuals who furthermore succeed in smuggling it have brought the prices down considerably. Porcelain also takes much space in the ships, and you honor say yourselves that you cannot obtain the curious pieces without which the profits can only be very small for us. At that time, the amount of porcelain the Chinese junks were bringing to Batavia was growing. 
And I don't have the detailed information Mickey showed us on the imports of Japanese porcelains in Batavia, which was a wonderful survey. Um, but I have a note uh, of protesting merchants in Batavia um, who were afraid that the company would limit their imports, their private imports as well. And they calculated in 1694 that about 2 million pieces of Chinese porcelain were imported into Batavia every year, of which 1,200,000 were designed for the local inter-Asian trade, 400,000 for the company, and 400,000 for private individuals. When the VOC stopped buying these Chinese porcelains, the private trade may have taken over most of the company's part. The end of the trade in porcelain by the Dutch East India Company had wide-reaching repercussions. First, the private imports of Chinese porcelain rose significantly, matching the growing demands in the Netherlands and in Europe. But for us, it is important to realize that nearly all Kangxi underglaze blue and enamel porcelain of the Kangxi period for the Dutch market was imported and sold privately. Since 1694, not a single piece of porcelain was shipped as company's cargo. It was all private trade. And this situation is also reflected in Augustus porcelain collection, because even the pre kangxi pieces were, were bought in Holland or via Dutch middlemen and ultimately were supplied by private merchants from the East, not by the Dutch East Company. This situation continued for more than 30 years. In 1728, the Dutch East India Company finally joined other European companies in the tea trade to Canton, and they started to sail directly to China and resumed buying porcelain as part of the return shipments. But in between, it was the private merchant who supplied the Dutch market with about a million pieces of porcelain every year. And if you know that the Dutch population at that time was about 3 million, then you can calculate that the country was flooded over and that it was interesting to re-export all this private porcelain to France, to Germany, to the Scandinavian countries and much further into Europe. It also may account for the strange lack of Famille Rose porcelains that uh, Rose Kerr noticed yesterday in the workshop. And um, because um, when the Dutch East India Company took over again the porcelain trade, they were not that much interested in the good stuff. And I think they blocked private trade not to disturb their own new interest in porcelain. So maybe the private traders did not have a good chance to continue their imports with the new style of the Famille Rose porcelains. I don't know this for sure, but it is an interesting coincidence that the Dutch East India Company started again in China and that Famille Rose porcelains are not that well represented here in the rest. Well, um, Via the Netherlands, these private traders, private merchants, also provided portion to other European countries, including Germany, of course. And how the supply for Augustus was organized is another fascinating story, but that will be told tomorrow um, by one of my colleagues. So let me conclude with this fascinating, sorry, fascinating image of the private merchants loading their private merchandise, warning their servants, please be careful with this very precious porcelain jar. Thank you very much.